here we go. So, yes, yeah, so with regards to the idea of, of God the Father, so the idea is that in order to make sense out of the world, you have to have an a priori cognitive structure. And that was something that Immanuel Kant, as I, as I said last time, um, uh, put forward as an argument against the idea that all of the information that we uh, acquire during our lifetime is a consequence of incoming sense data. And the reason that Kant objected to that, and he was absolutely right about this, is that you can't make sense of sense data without an a priori structure. You can't extract from sense data the structure that enables you to make sense of sense data. It's not possible. And that's really been demonstrated, I would say, beyond a shadow of a doubt, since the 1960s. And the best demonstration of that was actually the initial failure of artificial intelligence. Because when the AI people started promising that we would have fully functional and autonomous robots and, and artificial intelligence back in the 1960s, um, what they didn't understand and what stalled them terribly until about the early 1990s was that it was almost that the problem of perception was a much deeper problem than anybody ever recognized. Because like when you look out the world, you just see, well, look, there's objects out there. And by the way, you don't see objects. You see tools, J just so you know. And the neurobiology of that's quite clear. You don't see objects and infer utility. You see useful things and infer object. So it's actually the reverse of what people generally think. But the point is, is that regardless of whether you see objects or useful things, when you look at the world, you just see it. And you think, well, seeing is easy because there the things are. And all you have to do is, like, you know, turn your head and they appear. And that's just so wrong that it's, that it's, it's almost impossible to overstate. Like, the, the problem of perception is staggeringly difficult. And one of the primary reasons that we still don't really have autonomous robots, although we're a lot closer to it than we were in the 1960s, is because it turned out that you actually have to have a body. You have to have a body before you can think. And even more importantly, you have to have a body before you can see, because the act of seeing is actually the act of mapping the patterns of the world onto the patterns of the body. It's not things are out there, you see them, then you think about them, then you evaluate them, then you decide to act on them, and then you act. I mean, that, that you could call that a folk idea of, of psychological processing or perception. It's not, that is not how it works. Like your eyes, for example, map, one of the things they do is map right onto your spinal cord, for example. They map right onto your emotional system. So it's actually possible, for example, for people to be blind and still be able to detect facial expressions, which is to say you can with someone who's cortically blind, so they've had their visual cortex destroyed often by a stroke, they'll tell you that they can't see anything. But they can guess which hand you put up if you ask them to, and if you flash them pictures of angry or fearful faces, they show skin conductance responses to the more emotion-laden faces. And it's because, imagine that the world is made out of patterns, which it is, and then imagine that those patterns are transmitted to you electromagnetically, that through light, and then imagine that the pattern is duplicated on the retina, and then that pattern is propagated along the optic nerve, and then the pattern is distributed throughout your brain, and some of that pattern makes up what you call conscious vision, but other parts of it just activate your body. And so, for example, when I look at this, when I look at this, uh, this uh, whatever, it, whatever it is, <laughs> bottle, that's the word, <laughs> you know, when I look at it, especially with intent in mind, as soon as I look at it, the pattern of the, body, of the bottle activates the gripping mechanism of my hand, and part of the action of per, or the, the act of perception is to adjust my bodily posture, including my hand grip, to be of the optimal size to pick that up. And it, it's not that I see the bottle and then think about to, how to move my hand. That's too slow. It's that I use my motor, motor cortex to perceive the bottle, and that's actually somewhat independent of actually seeing the bottle as a conscious experience. So... Anyways, uh, the, the, re the reason that I'm telling you that all of that, and, and, and there's much more about that that can be told. Rodney Brooks, he's someone to know about. He's a robotics engineer who worked in the 1990s, and he invented the Roomba, um, among many other things. So he's a real genius, that guy. And uh, he, Brooks was one of the first people to really point out that uh, to, have, to be able to have a, 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 a machine that perceived well enough to work in the world, that you had to give it a body and that the perception would actually be built from the body up rather than the, from the abstract cognitive perceptions down. And so, well, and that, that turned out to be the case. And Brooks built all sorts of weird little machines in the 1990s that didn't even really have any central brain, but they could do things like run away from light. And so they could perceive light, but their perception was the act of running away from light. And so perception... Perception is very, very, very tightly tied to action in ways that people don't normally perceive. 
Anyways, that's all to say that you cannot perceive the world without being embodied. And, you know, you're embodied in a manner that's taken you roughly three and a half billion years to pull off, right? There's been a lot of death as a prerequisite to the embodied form that you take. And so it's taken all that trial and error to produce something like you that can interact with the complexity of the world well enough to last the relatively paltry 80 or so years that you can last. And so I think about that as, and this may be wrong, but I think it's a useful, at least it's a useful uh, hypothesis. I think the idea of God the Father is something like the birth of the idea that there has to be an internal structure that out of which consciousness itself arises that gives form to things. And, well, and, and if that's the case, and perhaps it's not, but if it's the case, it's certainly reflection. It's a reflection of the kind of factual truth that I've been describing now. And then, uh, like I also mentioned, that I kind of see the, the idea of both the Holy Spirit and also, also of Christ, and most specifically of Christ in, in the form of the Word. As the active consciousness that that structure produces and uses not only to, to formulate the world, because we formulate the world, at least the world that we experience, we formulate, but also to change and modify that world, because there's absolutely no doubt that we do that, partly with our bodies, which are optimally evolved to do that, which is why we have hands, unlike dolphins that have you know, very large brains like us, but can't really change the world. We're really adapted and evolved to change the world, and the world and our speech is really a, an extension of our ability to use our hands, so the speech systems that we use are, you know, very well-developed motor, uh, very well-developed motor skill. And generally speaking, your, your dominant linguistic hemisphere is the same as your dominant hand. And people talk with their hands, like me, as you may have noticed. And we use sign language, and there's a tight relationship between the use of the hand and the use of language. And that's partly because... Uh, language is a productive force, and the hand is part of, the, part of what changes the world. And so all those things are tied together in a very, very complex way with this a priori structure and also with the embodied structure. And I also think that's part of the reason why classical Christianity puts such an emphasis not only on the divinity of the spirit, but also on the divinity of the body, which is a harder thing to grapple with. You know, it's, it's easier for people to think if you think in religious terms at all, that you have some sort of transcendent spirit that's somehow detached from the body that might have some life after death, something like that. But the Christian Christianity in particular really insists on the divinity of the body. So the idea is that there's an underlying structure that's got this quasi-patriarchal nature, partly because it's, for complex reasons, but partly because it's a reflection of the social structure as well as other things. And then that uses consciousness in the form particularly of language, but most particularly in the form of truthful language in order to produce the world in a manner that's good. And I think that's a walloping, powerful, powerful idea, especially the relationship between the idea that it's truthful speech that gives rise to the good, because that's a really fundamental moral claim. And I think that's a tough one to beat, man, because one of the things I've really noticed is, and, and this and it isn't just me, that's for sure, is that... You know, there's a lot of tragedy in life. There's no doubt about that. And lots of people that I see, for example, in my clinical practice are laid low by the tragedy of life. But I also see very, very frequently that people get tangled up in deceit, in webs of deceit that are often multiple generations long. And that just takes them out. You know, and so, the, so deceit can produce extraordinary levels of suffering that, that last for very, very long periods of time. And that's really a clinical truism, you know, because Freud, of course, identified one of the problems that contributed to the suffering we might associate with mental illness with repression, which is kind of like a lie of omission. That's a perfectly reasonable way to think about it. And Jung stated straight out that there was no difference between the psychotherapeutic, the curative psychotherapeutic effort and supreme moral effort, including truth. That, those were the same thing as far as he was concerned. And Carl Rogers, another great clinician who was at one point a Christian missionary before he became um, more, more, more strictly scientific, he believed that it was in truthful dialogue that... that that uh, clinical transformation took place. And, you know, it, 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 and, of course, one of the prerequisites for genuine transformation in the clinical setting is that 
the therapist tells the truth and the client tells the truth because otherwise how in the world do you know what's going on? How can you solve a problem when you don't even know what the problem is? And you don't know what the problem is unless the person tells you the truth. That's something really to think about in light of your own relationships because you know, if you don't tell the people around you the truth then they don't know who you are. And maybe that's a good thing, you know, because well, seriously, people have reasons to lie, right? I mean, that aren't trivial. But it's really worth knowing that you can't even get your hands on the problem unless you formulate it truthfully. And if you can't get your hands on the problem, the probability that you're going to solve it is, is just so low.